Welcome to Gaia Community. This week we are, as we always are, an Earth-based pagan Unitarian Universalist congregation meeting weekly in our space at 4327 Troost and coming to you by glorious simulcast as a hybrid platform service over Zoom and later YouTube. This week, we will be doing the first week of our two-week patron selection festival, hearing from the temples of Persephone, Lou, Ariadne, and Sochapelli. Uh, three of our powers will be presenting in person here at the space, and the temple of Lou will be presenting digitally from a remote space. So we are fully hybrid in every way. It's very exciting. There will be some times that the camera physically moves. I will try to preface that so that if you are watching this later or joining us hybridly, you can avert your eyes from any shaking that might cause discomfort in your viewing experience. To get us started today, we light a chalice and somewhat differently from what we often do for a chalice lighting, this one will be responsive. So I am going to say a line and if you would all echo back in this sacred space. We gather together in this sacred space. Let us, still in, the quiet. Let us be still in the quiet. In this sacred space. Let our hearts open as butterflies' wings. In this sacred space. May the glow of this light shine within us. In this sacred space. And our chalice is lit. Bless it be. Bless it be. I have gotten ahead of myself and set the thematic introduction early. So we come next to grounding. Before we travel mentally or perhaps physically to the temple of all powers where all of our presenting powers and many more dwell, I invite you to take a little time to check in with yourself. And we begin with a deep breath. And I invite you to continue breathing slowly and deeply and consider how do I feel today? What values matter to me? What am I seeking in matters of spiritual kinship? What needs do I seek to have fulfilled by this community? What values or works put forward by powers do I think will best help Gaia community become a place that will serve those needs. As you continue to consider these points, know that your needs are valued and this selection process has as its goal 
the meeting of the most spiritual needs of the most members and will in no way require that any member or attendee adopt a personal patron relationship with any of the powers introduced or selected. As with all of our rights, you are invited to participate at the level of your own comfort. Keeping your stewardship of self and belief in the good of others forward in your mind, I invite you to settle into a comfortable position if you are not already in one. And I invite you to focus your gaze on the flame in the chalice. Breathing deeply, watching that single point of light as it moves and dances, letting it grow filling all of your attention, becoming the single most important thing, letting it burn away distraction and concern, brightening and filling your awareness. As that light fills your awareness, let it carry with it a sense of the sacredness of the space around you, the inherent sacredness of all space upon the earth. And in these spaces we occupy, we will build a temple of our thoughts, intention, imaginings, and will. We construct around us the temple to many powers, a place you may have visited before or may be visiting today for the very first time. Allow your inner eye to see the temple taking shape around us. Allow your inner ear to hear its sounds. We are building this temple together and you are invited to share your vision with the group and we ask that when someone calls out some truth about this temple we are building together, you weave it into your own visualization, strengthening the shared space around us. What do you see when you look at this temple we are building around us? Many doors and courtyards. I see structural integrity, pillars and flowers. Many temples coming from a central centers. Sense of agelessness. Many 
any seekers. Remember, I've mentioned some What details do you notice? The doors of the temple are open wide, welcoming all. Sound of instruments being played, voices being raised. Stars sparkling in the arch ceiling above. What expressions of artistry? Do you experience? Carvings, even in uh, ceramic pieces, uh, wood, ceramic clay, all materials that build for different gods, and they all intricate. Beauty of hand woven cloth in many different patterns and colors. What do you experience that tells you this is sacred space? Sense of peace. Sense of awe, respect, calm of sanctity. What do you hear that lets you know others are with you in this place? Those echoes. Breath. Sounds of tinkling instruments being played softly. What tells you that there is power, that there is magic, that the divine is near in this place? A sense of mystery. Peace box. The vibration in the air. Religious symbols everywhere. And it is into such a space with open doors and many paths to many courtyards, lit by multitudinous candles with the sounds of instruments and devotional songs prayers, and breath, and intricate carvings denoting each space and the power that resides within into that charged moment of air 
and sense of agelessness and weight that we enter the temple of all powers and establish among us our sacred space of power and protection, our connection to the many worlds and ways, even those we might never reach of worship. Today, we will begin this journey by attending the temple of Persephone. There will be a brief moment of camera vibration and lighting adjustment as we make our way to the temple of Persephone. And if we could mute so that it's not jarring when I move the microphone. Welcome to the Temple of Persephone. We welcome you today. And at the start of our night, hail to you, Hestia, ever virgin, by your oath, the heart keeper, firstborn and lastborn, in gratitude for your service in keeping the hearth fires burning, you have a right to the first offering only. I present to you today, Persephone. Persephone, reluctant or willing, consort of Hades, queen of the underworld, but also dutiful daughter who emerges back into the upper world for a season each year, bringing with her all of the joys of spring, the fertility of summer, and the abundance of harvest. They say she was abducted and raped with her father's permission. They say she was tricked into eating six seeds of a pomegranate which in the way things work in myths, bound her into the underworld for life. Maybe. You have to notice though, that she at the very least made the best of it. Here in Middle Earth, she was a little, shall we say, smothered in mother love? You have to admit that Demeter went a little bit overboard in her grief and rage, plunging the world into bitter cold and darkness just because Persephone escaped her direct control. However, that happened to come about. Maybe Persephone, as Corey, was completely innocent and completely happy, picking flowers in the meadow. No interest, whatever, in sexuality. No urge to enter into her own power. You know, the teenage daughter, every loving mother, wants hers to be. 
Maybe. However, that might be. When she emerges each spring, it's not as an adolescent, completely under her mother's power and control. She's not innocent any longer. She still cares about her mother's feelings. And she still cares about things that are alive. The suffering of the people, the animals, and the plants that are being denied sunshine and growth by her mother's rage. But she emerges as a queen in her own right. This Persephone, the re-emerging Persephone, holds the knowledge of life and death. She is reborn into the earth. And earth rejoices. Spring is more delicious, more miraculous, because of the contrast with the seeming barrenness of winter. Like Persephone, spring emerges, tiny and tentative at first from within the earth. Like the dying and reanimating God, like the grain in the field, this goddess has lain fallow in the below world and she comes back changed. Beautiful Persephone, bringer of the spring, merciful Persephone, Hear us as we sing. Gracious, sweet duality of the human soul, timeless, great divinity, come and make us whole. Fair and just Persephone of the life reborn, comforting Persephone, guide us to the morn. Share with us your mystery. Lead us in your ways. Daughter Queen Persephone, smile upon our praise. Stir in us exuberance for the paths we choose. Wake in us acceptance of the things that we must lose. Filled with grace, Persephone, maidenly and mild, Yet grace attends Persephone, sensual and wild. Ancient one, transforming one, ready us to meet every trial, every change, never with retreat. Radiant Persephone, queen of all who die, brilliant Persephone, hear us as we cry. You are not forsaken now. Aspect we adore. We return to honor you today and evermore. Glorious Persephone of the soul's dark night. Shining one, Persephone, guide us to the light. Hail Persephone. Hail, Hail Persephone. Persephone. I will make offerings to Persephone. I am going to offer fresh mint. The only way she likes mint is fresh. There's a story there. I offer flower petals, sweet cakes, Grain, the juice of the pomegranate, honey, and unwatered wine. I make these offerings, Persephone, to show you honor.
It's the mature spring goddess whom I suggest can be a guide as we re-emerge into the light of the changed world after our long winter of COVID. Despite the rocky beginning, many of the old, old tales show us a fully mature, wise sovereign, completely in charge of her role in the underworld, making judgments and dealing justice, but tempered with mercy. In a number of mythic tales, she's persuaded to allow someone to lead the underworld again. Although I have to point out that it rarely, rarely works out quite that way in the end, in those stories. But she was going along with it. It's a, a comforting aspect to a powerful underworld figure. In some of her worship in ancient times, rather than releasing the dead back into the world of the living, Persephone was said to hold the keys to an eternal life in another world, or at least a better accommodation in the nether worlds. One of my favorite poets, Edna St. Vincent Millay, painted a wistful, hopeful picture of the goddess when Edna was mourning the loss of a young friend. Be to her, Persephone, all the things I might not be. Take her head upon your knee, she that was so proud and wild, flippant, arrogant, and free. She that had no need of me was a lonely little child lost in hell. Persephone, take her head upon your knee. Say to her, my dear, my dear, it is not so dreadful here. Exploring the returning Persephone has the potential to help us work through how to use the experience of lying fallow locked down, masked, six feet apart, to gain wisdom and skills that we can use to enhance our joy in returning to an upper world. We know that during that time, we've not been stagnant. We've grown, we've changed. We've learned new habits, new skills, new routines. We return to the light changed from our time underground. And now we must change again, finding new ways to celebrate life, new ways to care for the earth and each other. Who better to turn to, to reinvent ourselves into a changed world than a goddess who has returned to the light from the world of the dead again and again across the millennia. We don't have full knowledge of how Persephone was worshiped in ancient times, as the most important details of those rites were sacred secrets. And frankly, some of what we do know wouldn't suit us in the slightest. Her mysteries have caught the imagination of generations of students of the occult and learning. Learning more about the ancient rites is one way to celebrate her as a patron. But I think the more inviting prospect is to develop new perspectives and new ways to celebrate the cycles of nature and life. We do know there was dancing and flowers and feasting and delight. I propose that we use her inspiration and guidance to find new ways to worship together in these liminal times between the COVID world and the post-COVID world that we hope we are tentatively entering. Are we there yet? As kids say, I'm not sure. Even now, 
we're learning to take things one day at a time, one set of data at a time. Let us turn to and embrace this threshold goddess, not to guide us into the underworld, but instead to help us navigate, to negotiate our renewed freedom in the world under the light of the sun. May it be so. Persephone, we thank you for your presence and your blessing today. Accept these final tokens of our fidelity. And please offer to our loved ones who dwell now in your realm your comfort and your mercy. Hail and thank you, Persephone. Thank you all for your gracious listening. And giving thanks to the Temple of Persephone, we go now to our digital temple, the Temple of Lou. There will be a spotlight change, and we will mute here in the space. And those of you who are physically here, Please direct yourselves as you are able. Wall. Mm. So I invite you now to walk with me to the Temple of Lou. And I have set up sacred space here, in parallel with yours there, that we might all be able to journey where we need to. So at this point, I come to the place in ADF Ritual, where I would invite the patron of our right to be with us now. And I invite you all to lend your attention as well. I call to Lu Lamfada, but not Lu is the warrior. I call to Lu Ardri, but not as the High King. I call to Lu Sawildanak, but not in his role as the All Skilled. I call to Lu as the child of Kian and Eithner, the grandchild of Baylor, as the foster of Goivna as the foster of Telsha, as the foster of Manan and MacLear. Lou, I invite you to our right to attend in your own person. Hail Lou. So I invite a very specific incarnation or aspect of Lou today, because we at Gaia Community have had Lou as a patron previous years, uh, twice I believe over the time, some of you have been here for all those times and some of you have not. Uh, Lou was the first patron we had after we came to the space that you all are sitting in now. And so the question comes up, of course, why Lou again? Why should we go back to the well, as it were? And I put it for your consideration that one of Lou's strengths is not necessarily in his skills or his prowess in battle or even his leadership, but his connections. Lou is a child of multiple tribes. Part of Lou's heritage and part of Lou's destiny is that he comes from both the Tuatha Dé Danann and from the Fomorian who they fight. And so Lou crosses those boundaries. Lou spends time with Manana McLear after Manana picks him up out of the waters, takes him home, teaches him everything he can, and then says, all right, kid, that was fun, but I'm out of ideas. You should go find somebody else to learn from. And Lou says, great, love it. And he does. He goes off and he studies with Goibna the Smith. And he goes off and he studies with Telsha, learns 
battle and tactics, but he journeys and he learns from other people. He doesn't assume that he knows what is best. He doesn't assume that where he comes from makes him the best. Lou is open to new ideas. Lou is open to the influence and the experiences of others. And that's the Lou that I want to put up for your consideration today. The Lou that is able to gather experiences without appropriating them. The Lou that is able to cross borders, that is able to join in respectfully and fully with those he does not know yet so that he might learn and become better. The Lou who is able to put aside what he's learned and make himself of that child mind where he can participate and learn something that was never presented to him before. I think this is the strength of Gaia community, but it's also in recent times been a struggle. Uh, Gaia community has, even before COVID, become very um, stable in its membership, we'll say. Um, acquiring new people, inviting new people in has been difficult for us. Uh, we've met them, they join us, and often they wander away. And I don't say that to blame anyone. I don't say that to say that we've done it wrong. I say that we could do better. I say that we could use Lou's experience, his travels, and his ways of being open as a way to model ourselves to new things, new people, new experiences going forward in this um, new reality. We're not post-COVID. We are still in the midst of COVID, but things are different. Uh, as Persephone's Temple mentioned, we have to deal with the world as it is. And so Lou gives us the opportunity to say, all right, sounds like fun. Let's do it. And so that's the Lou that I want to present to you. That's the Lou that I hope we can work with for a year. That's the Lou that will, I believe, tell us what it is that his experiences lend to us. But more importantly, that will encourage us to listen to others that we might find new things and new ways of interacting with our own services, with our environment, with our community, uh, with our broader community, with all the people that we encounter, uh, and not to continue doing the same thing over and over again uh, until the last day. So that is my pitch. I want to uh, take a few moments now to make a few additional offerings. I know that you are not physically able to make offerings uh, to the offering bowl that I have, but if you have uh, anything you want to ask or add or uh, contribute to this display, I invite you to let uh, Matt know so that you can be uh, put on audio as well. And I will uh, finish up with an omen in a few moments. Matt, is there anything else to be added before I go on? Oh, uh, all is well.
And if I invite Lou himself to speak, to pass back part of his knowledge as part of this interaction and sampling that we have today. Lou sends three words for us. He sends Ur, which is Heather, which is death and rebirth. It is hearth and love. It is the letter U. He sends Ruish, which is the red elderberry, which is the other world, which is the world of where the Bhathadidana reside now. And he sends Ido, the U, the last Om, Oam, which, as I've mentioned in some rituals before, is about completion and longevity and also sometimes death, but death in the sense of completing a thing and going on. And so with that, I appreciate your time. I appreciate Lou's time. And I wish to close with one more musical piece and an offering, and then I will return you to the Temple of All Powers. As we return to the Temple of All Powers, we make our way to the Temple of Ariadne. There will be some camera shake as the light and the camera get fully put into position. Welcome to the Temple of Ariadne. I invite the three great mothers, Rhea, Terasia, Posidea, to join us. I invite Ariadne to join us here in our sacred rite. Behold, We are children of Earth. Hail Rhea. Hail Rhea. Behold, we are children of the sun. Hail Terracia. 
And behold, we are children of the sea. Hail, Posidea. Ariadne, mistress of the labyrinth, queen of bees, lily of the field, we welcome you along with the great mothers. This temple is consecrated by your presence. Hail Ariadne. We have come today to learn of Ariadne and to ask her blessing. But first, I honor again those three great mothers. I make offering of unspun wool to Rhea, the earth mother. I make offering of fiery saffron, beautiful and yellow, to Teresia, the mother of the sun. And I make offering of flowers to Posidea, the mother of the sea. Finally, I offer wine to the great mothers. I offer wine to Ariadne. I ask them to look kindly upon our right. Today, I begin by telling a story. This is an old story, and it's a story you've heard before. You may have heard me tell it before, but stories are magical things, and with each new telling, a new facet, and a new way of understanding can be revealed. So I want to tell you an old story today in a new way, and I invite you to keep your mind's eye open as you listen. See what new understanding comes to life. This story takes place in a temple on Crete in the city of Knossos. This temple, like all of the Cretan temples, serves many powers. Among the gods worshiped here are Minos, Minos, the god of the moon, the celestial lawgiver. Among the goddesses worshiped here is Pasiphae, the horned cow goddess giver of life-giving milk. These gods are well-known and well-loved to their people. Among the gods we worship here also, you might find Daedalus, the craftsman god. We must remember him in our story today because he is the crafter of the labyrinth, that sacred space which is at the story's heart at the heart of this temple. The labyrinth is the dancing ground of Ariadne. When Minos, who keeps time by stars and moon, declares the time to be right, the labyrinth will open and people will enter, descending into the dark to face whatever lies within. But these are not the terrified youth of Athens. At the time of this story, Athens has not been invented yet. And it will be many, many years before Theseus lifts that rock that keeps him from his sword and sandals. So who? Who has come to dance with Ariadne? It is the people of Crete, the people of Knossos. Perhaps the people of neighboring isles who come here to celebrate her mysteries. Ariadne. Let us sing of Ariadne. She is the mistress of the labyrinth, the mistress of mysteries. She teaches the snake dance and the crane dance. She whose thread measures the curving paths of the labyrinth. She leads us safely in and out again. 
and ask for your assistance, Matt, if you will. As I invite those present to take a ball of yarn in memory of Ariadne's thread. And if you are joining us from far away, or if you do not wish to take the ball of yarn, I invite you to imagine the weight of it in your hand, a ball of thread. To imagine unrolling it, unspooling it, feeling it rough or soft within your hands. To imagine this ball of yarn passing through your fingers, anchored to some fixed point behind you, always able to guide you back to a place of safety. In the story you know, Ariadne is the daughter of Minos and Pasiphae, who are mortal royals. She is a mortal princess. She greets each group of sacrificial Athenian youth, but she falls for golden Theseus when she sees him among the doomed, and she gives him the thread that will bring him safely through his trials. But, as I said, this is not that story. Theseus is not yet even a dream of his great-great-grandfather. So, who is Ariadne now in this story? What is the meaning of her thread, if not to guide the hero in and out of danger? In this story, Ariadne is the daughter of Rhea, that great mother of the earth. Ariadne is a mighty goddess in her own right. She walks between the worlds of the living and of the ancestors. Each year descending to care for those who have passed on, to bless the dead with her presence and to prepare them for rebirth. And when the time is right, she, like Persephone, returns to the world above with the first green shoots of grain, a gift from the earth to the people, or a gift from the ancestors to those who still live, that grain which grows up from the deep, dark earth. Her thread is the thread of fate. Her thread spools out behind each of us, counting the choices and consequences we have known, anchored to a fixed point in our own history. It is not merely a thread or a beautiful shining hero. It is in true Unitarian Universalist fashion, a fate that saves all. Each initiate holds the thread as they enter the labyrinth. Each initiate takes hold of this gift of Ariadne's, this anchor point, as they enter the darkness. At this point, I invite you to think about what anchors you. What certainties form that fixed point in your story? What assurances do you have of safety, past, present, or future? What makes you feel secure as you explore new things? Sweet Ariane of the Mysteries, I ask that you guide us along this labyrinth of life, this twisting and turning path that winds out into the world and that coils up deep within each one of us. Take us safely to the deep, dark places and lead us safely and surely out again so that we may be beacons of hope for those who have not yet made the journey so that we all may find the mystery that lies within. As you know, 
the labyrinth is home to a monster, the Minotaur. To enter into the gates of mystery is to prepare to face this monster, this great beast. This is the heart of magic, to go into the darkness, to confront the terrors that lie there, to emerge whole and strong, but changed on the other side face that beast within, knowing it for what it is. And what is a monster anyway? If we follow that word monster back through history, we discover that the root of it is the same root that means to bring to mind or to show, to teach, to warn. A monster is a mirror of possibility. A monster shows us what we might be and allows us to choose. The Minotaur in this story is called Taurus Asterion, the starry bull of heaven. He is the bull of the moon, itself a mirror that shows us what might be. The moon bull, the minotaur, is not a devourer, but a revealer. He terrifies the explorer of the mysteries as he challenges them, as he reveals possibilities. He is also a guardian. So those who pass through the labyrinth like all initiates, emerge stronger from their journey into darkness. The mystery becomes a source of strength, a fountain of calm in this wild and whirling world. This is the gift of Ariadne. This is the challenge of Taurus Asterion. And we need not go to Crete or explore the darkness below abandoned buildings to find the labyrinth. Every city is a labyrinth. Every heart, every mind. A devotion to Ariadne would require us to face that work of exploration, to go into the darkness, face our fears, to learn the ways that we ourselves are fearful to others. A devotion to Ariadne is a choice to choose to explore these mysteries, to confront our own monsters. This devotion also requires us aid those who are lost in mazes of all kinds, be that the mazes of pain and trauma, the mazes imposed by bureaucracy, or other confusing and twisting paths in which we might become imprisoned. And it requires us to continue our care for the living and the dead, and for the earth herself. That is what Ariadne offers us and her challenge to us if we choose to take it. I make one final offering of wine. The great mothers to Ariadne, to Taros Asterion. Kindly upon us as we walk the paths of the mystery. Hail, Rhea. Hail, Terracia. Hail, Terracia. Hail, Posidea. Hail, Posidea. Hail, the mothers. And hail, Ariadne. Hail. Blessings upon you now and forever. I invite you to carry the blessings of this temple out into the world. 
peace upon us all, peace upon us all, peace ever be upon us all. And as we transition outward from the Temple of Ariadne, we make our way to the Temple of Sochipelli, where once again, there will be a visual and possibly audio disruption. And now we come to a horse of an entirely different color. I would imagine that not too many of us had ever heard of Sir Chappelle before this whole process started. He was certainly new to me, pardon me, they were new to me. Joe Chappelle is a deity of Mesoamerica. Aztec to be specific, although they show up in various names in all of the Mesoamerican cultures. Xochitl Pele is the deity of dance, of flowers and herbs of all kinds, of the arts, of the soul. So Xochitl Pele comes from a highly severely colonialized culture. A culture that has to some degree embraced or been made to embrace the culture that took it over. There are various ways to approach being overrun, having your culture be under attack, having your language be under attack. One way is to be fabulous. And that's the way that Zochapelle took and takes. Zochapelle has an identical twin sister named Zochiketzel. Maybe that's an alter ego. Just maybe Zochopelli dances and twists and turns into Zochiketzel with great joy and abandon. What's one way to survive your culture being brutalized? Become a clown. Become joyful. Cultivate felicity. What do I mean when I say cultivate felicity? Very wise woman who grew up under a couple of different handicaps once told me, you have to learn to cultivate the daily felicities. That little violet that you might walk over, that you might step on, that just happens to thrive from being stepped on. The more you pick them, the more they bloom. In a culture that values masculinity, and oppresses femininity, a frivolous being that delights in flowers, in dance, in pleasure, in feasting, is a mighty good disguise. It's a good way 
to survive. It's a good way to thrive with nonviolence. You can accept what is going on in the world around you, but you find your way through it by beautiful colors, by fancy and wonderful fabrics, by planting and growing beautiful flowers and herbs, and learning how to use those flowers and herbs to prepare wonderful meals, fantastic medicines. This sort of a, of a lifestyle also takes care of everybody that is other. Watches out for all those little beings who don't fit in who shy away, who are stepped on, and nurtures them and brings them to a place where they might realize, hey, here's a place I can fit in. Here's a place that I can grow my own special gifts and become part of something that values me exactly as I am. That's a unique gift. That's something that we as a community have done pretty good at in some ways. And in some ways, it's awful comfortable to be in your own little circle of friends. It's harder to reach out. It's harder to meet somebody where they are and not where we are. That's a stretch. That's a risk. It's scary. All risk is scary. But if you're having a fabulous time and you're feasting, and you're delighting in your own sensuality that draws people to you. That makes you realize that it's perfectly all right to be exactly as you are and who you are, but it also comes with the responsibility of social change, of finding ways to reach those who need us the most and include them. That's uncomfortable. That's real uncomfortable. But what do we gain by that risk? In a culture famous for glorifying hypermasculinity, being not that can be seen as being crazy, can be seen as being high. Have you ever been in a place where you and your friends were laughing so loud and so hard within your group that everybody looked at you funny? I was tossed out of a truck stop as a teenager. <laughs> I and my little group of friends, because they thought we were drunk. No, we were just high on each other's company. I have never forgotten that bit. It was one of the more fun times I had as approaching adulthood. And probably none of those people thought about it. But I remember every single person I was with then and feel a special kinship with them from that. Zocho Pele isn't a deity that sits on some throne and expects to be given gifts, no. Zocho Pele is that fabulous uncle who's busy out at the, the kitchen, churning out all those wonderful treats that everybody loves. The favorite place in Zocchio Pelli's house is the kitchen. 
that's where everybody gravitates because that's where the fun is. That's where the camaraderie is. That's where people go to feel nurtured. Zochapelli is also the only non-European deity that we are considering. Please bear in mind, this is also Pride Month. Zochapelli is about as out there as can be. An example for us that not only that being different is all right, that being absolutely who you are is the only way to be, but also that keeping an eye out for others who need that fabulous energy is part of the responsibility. What would Zochapelli do for our community? Remind us that even though things have been pretty grim and continue to be pretty scary, we have to find ways to express that joy. We have the responsibility to ourselves and to the world to image that joyousness, that healing nature, that abundance of soul that this group has. What would Zochopelli expect of us? To do the work of social justice, to see to the earth and to each other, to take on the burden of developing and expressing felicity. The greatest gift that we can give to one another is acceptance of ourselves exactly the way we are. With all of our moods, all of our frights, all of our anxiety, all of that. But have you ever noticed if you're in a position where you need to be on, you need to express joy, you need to be an example for others. And you put on the act of, I'm happy, I'm joyous, I'm every bit of everything I should be. You end up convincing yourself. If you haven't done that, I recommend trying it. Pretty powerful stuff. Zocho Pelli is, I believe, the best chance we have to meet the promises we have already made. I would ask you to consider what parts of yourselves express Zocho Pelli and Zocho Quetzal, because there's room for both. I thank you for listening. I thank you for being here. I thank you for the sense of family and kinship and love that we all share. And I hope that we go forward from here stronger and happier and better than ever before together. As we give thanks to all the powers we have heard from today, the Temple of Persephone, the Temple of Lu, the Temple of Ariadne, and the Temple of Zotropel. We make our way back to that altar where we began, the altar of the chalice, and there will be once again a brief disruption as we make that visual journey.
having heard from four powers under consideration for the next community patron at Gaia community, we find ourselves at a time that it is time to return ourselves to the world we so often occupy and to make that journey from the temple of all powers back to the mundane world, I invite you to return your gaze to the chalice flame. That one bright point of light in the center of this focus or the light of your home altar and allow that flame once again to become a singular point of focus, filling your attention, filling your consciousness with bright light. Until you begin to feel the temple fading away. The wonders begin to recede and the physical world around you begins once more to take precedence. Until you have this one dancing flame in your mind's eye. Then, with a deep breath, allow your attention to expand from that single point of light, dwindling back to its modest proportions contained within the space where it is. As we return to the everyday world, we can and will journey again to the temple of many powers. But that story and those powers will come another day. So we come to the point of our time together where we share announcements and take our offering. If you wish to support Gaia community monetarily so that we can continue putting on hybrid rituals like this one in our space and online, we invite you to do so at gaiacommunity.org slash support us. We are also, as always, taking donations for Harvester's Food Bank or the food bank nearest you. There is a link on our Discord pinned in the social justice channel that can also be put out to Facebook or wherever your Gaia community news is retrieved. Next week at Gaia community, we will be doing the second week of this patron selection festival, after which our ranked choice vote will commence. What other events are coming? And because I know this mic is very directional, for those of you in the space, I will likely repeat you for those who are not in the space. Most importantly, Aaron's birthday is this week. <laughs> and if you join us for Joys and Concerns of a Thursday evening at 8 p.m., also on Zoom, that will be this week. Do we have other announcements? Well, our powers did not take quite all the time allotted to them, and neither did the frame. So I believe we can, in call and response form, do our entire closing. So I invite you, call and response, and you can unmute online friends if you care to. By the earth that is her body. By the earth, By the earth that is her body. And the grove that is his home. And the grove, and the grove that is his home. By the air that is her breath. By the, By the air that is her breath. And the music of his song. And the music of his song. By the fire of her bright spirit. By the fire of her bright spirit. And the heat of his passion. And the heat of his passion. 
by the waters of her living womb, by the waters of her living womb, and the dew that is his tears, and the dew that is his tears. This circle is open but unbroken. This circle is open but unbroken. May the peace of the goddesses go in our hearts. May the peace of the goddesses go in our hearts. And the dance of the gods enliven our days. And the dance of the gods enliven our days. And may we care for the earth and each other. May we care for the earth and each other. Because our lives depend on it. Because our lives depend on it. And all together, Mary meet, Mary, Mary part, part, and Mary, and Mary meet again. again. I invite those joining us from elsewhere to also extinguish your chalice at this time for fire safety. Mm -hmm.